So sometime in the last few days, there was an article released online from a website that's connected with a rather famous, kind of old, in a sense, journal called First Things. First Things has a a glorious history in the thinking man's version of American Christianity, started by Richard John Newhouse of late great LCMS fame, but actually Roman Catholic fame, sort of the coming home poster child of the 60s and 70s, particularly 70s, connected to the Seminex movement and whatnot. A guy who considered himself not to have truly left his Lutheranism, but who have gone to where it really was being practiced, and we can talk about that some other place, some other time. But the magazine, which he started first things, as a Roman Catholic priest, became a a who's who place for the intellectuals of American Christianity to jive on things that they found important, sometimes with satire, sometimes with seriousness. I I had a prescription, I had a subscription for a little while. It was a little too dense for me, honestly. I just couldn't read it all. I don't, I'm not that kind of sit-down-and-think thinker. But it is still out there. When he died a few years ago, it, it kind of lost some of its kick, but it's still going, and they apparently have an online presence as well. And there was an article that was published there by an LCMS pastor. And it's not rare for LCMS pastors to be published in First Things. It's part of a, an ecumenical contribution of the best sense that we would contribute to the conversation that leaders of Christianity, conservative Christianity really, in the United States, that we would con- con- contribute to that conversation, our own thoughts on matters that are important to us. But what struck me about this article was not so much what it said, and that I, I totally agree with most of what it said, but the, the audacity and courage of the author to say what he said as he said it. He had some courage to protest against a rather significant and loud movement in American Christianity, and as a result in LCMS Lutheran American Christianity for the last 30, 40, 50 years. So loud and so strong that it has caused a significant division within the Missouri Synod. If you're not following the inside baseball of that, you don't have to, but it should be known that There once was a fight between liberals and conservatives over whether or not the Bible is true. And while that might still be creeping around the edges of some of our other conversations, the real fight these days is pretty much about, do you use the liturgy or not? That's at the very least, that's the banner. That's the flag that the troops rally behind on either side. And there's no quicker way to get into an uncomfortable conversation with another Missouri Synod Lutheran than to start talking about liturgy. Sadly, because people are going to think you're talking about something other than perhaps what you're talking about. And maybe that's sort of what we're going to talk about today a little bit here. You know, what does it mean to rally around the liturgy? Does it mean that you're you're all about the organ? Because in my mind, that the answer is no to that. That has nothing to do with it. The organ is ne- neither here nor there when I'm talking about the liturgy of the church and the history of divine worship and, the, well, the biblical nature of divine worship. Anyway, you you can almost not get into a fight quicker with someone than than by bringing this up than perhaps, perhaps Trump, right? I mean, yeah, the the leveler of all things. The valleys rise up and the mountains lay down low to make flat space because nothing is more offensive, it would seem, than our our current president to, to many, to all, I don't know. But after that, liturgy. And making a claim that liturgy is a required thing in the church, that it is a biblical thing in the church, that we're not free to just do whatever we want when we gather on Sunday morning. We're certainly not free to change it for the sake of what? What what reason, what emotion, what work could we bring to bear that would compel us to put in place of the words of God the commandments of men? See, but this is already uh, probably angering some because I'm just equating liturgy with words of God, and you're going to ask, well, how can you say that? How can you equate what are man's words with God's words? I'm going to say, I'm not, you see, this is why we're not talking to each other. This is why we don't understand each other. You think I'm talking about man's words, and I don't. I think I'm talking about an actual pattern of Scripture. I'm talking about what the Scriptures actually teach is the thing that saves us and is the thing that gathers us. And I'm saying you're not free to change that. And you're saying, well, I don't ever change that. 
All we do is change the music. And I'm saying, I'm not so sure because it smells different to me these days. Yeah. As one who, by the way, all, all the cards on the table here, I led the praise band, man. I strummed that guitar and I sang the harmonies and uh, did it feel, well, it, it was supposed to feel good. I was trying to feel good. I was looking for my God in that song. Yeah. And, and it was the words. It was the words that eventually saved me. And it was the words that convinced me that there was something amiss in all of this matter. Even so, the article, the article on First Things was about how the argument that we should be changing the liturgy and readorning it, shifting it, remarketing it, doing whatever we can to it, even letting it go entirely. The argument comes out of this thing that called itself Fuller Seminary, 1960s, 70s, 80s, the Church Growth Movement. And it had at its core, at its heart, a belief that the church should be growing at all costs and that this is basically a Pelagian reality. What do I mean when I say Pelagian? Pelagius was a early church heretic. He was condemned, although his teachings around amongst many still today. What was he condemned for? He was condemned for teaching a wrong anthropology, that is, a wrong understanding of mankind's abilities. He taught that man could, of his own reason and strength, come to Jesus Christ, his Lord, right? He didn't have to. Well, he maybe needed to hear about him, but he did, at the end of the day, make his own choice, action, uh, move. It was on his shoulders, on man's shoulders, to get to God. And the church growth movement, coming out of Baptist, American Baptist theology, Enlightenment Baptist theology, I should really call it, uh, rationalistic Baptist theology, was all about decisions, right? There's no problem with that. Of course, God's done as much as he can possibly do. The grace has been purchased for you on the cross. Now all that remains is for you to reach out and take the gift he's handing to you. Yeah? I mean, that, that's kind of, I think I put the best construction on the way they say it there, right? That all that's left is for you to en- engage that act of faith, that power of decision, that free will that God has given you. I'm lying, by the way, right? This is not what we actually preach, but this is what the Baptists preach. It, all that remains is for you to do that. Now, is that thinking, that thinking is where the church growth movement comes from in the belief that God has not chosen an elect amount, a total elect amount that we cannot either add to or subtract from before the end of the great day, and that he is working this entirely monogersically, right? Uh, monogers, uh, monergism, uh, mono ergaos, uh, two Greek words there, right? Alone and worker, right? God is alone the worker in salvation for all mankind. That is not what Baptists really, classic Baptists, American Baptists, and there's a few Calvinists out there, but the majority of them, they do not believe this. And so this church growth movement does not believe this. And while you're going to have, certainly those within the Missouri Synod are going to say something like, well, of course we reject the decision theology, but we still believe that we can learn from these things. I mean, don't we need to like understand that it's a good idea to have room in your parking lot, right? It's always the, the, the red herring there is, oh, you're, you're against parking lots, right? Uh, no, no one's against parking lots. Uh, but see, when, when you bring in the entire thrust of the movement and you think, I'm just going to pull off you know, the frosting on the side, but the core is going to never change at all, well, you, you seem to miss something here. Because the movement of the church growth movement, it's not just about how man individually can impact salvation, Pelagian style, with his own heart. It's also applying the Pelagian error to the activity of the mission itself. That is to say, that salvation for the unbeliever, salvation for the pagan, the one who's outside of the church, is enacted and occurs as a result caused by the actions of men within the church. That is, for the church to grow, men must do things. And without us sinful fallen men doing things, the church cannot grow. No, indeed, the stones will not cry out if we are silent, is effectively the thought behind that reality, right? Now, of course, the, the, the straw man here is to say, well, Pastor Fisk, you're saying we don't have to do anything. Well, yes, I am. I'm not saying we're not going to do anything. I'm, I am saying we don't have to do anything. And, and there's a massive dis- difference between the two, and it's the difference between law and gospel, honestly. It's the difference between faith and unbelief. So if you think we have to do something, then you are a Pelagian. Straight up, you are a Pelagian. If, if we have to do something in order to be saved, you're a Pelagian. Yeah. Whether it's for us to be saved by making the decision ourselves, or whether it's for us to do something for them out there. Because frankly, frankly, 
you know, in many various ways, God spoke to his people bold by, his, by the prophets. And while I don't believe personally that that's going to happen today, I believe it's going to happen from our mouths. I'm not going to put it past him that if we all shut our mouths, he might do something indeed, right? We're not going to shut our mouths. But see, the argument isn't really about whether our mouths are open. The argument is about whether we think we can change the mission of God. We can make it better. Or whether or not we believe it's already been given to us as an entire total, and the most that we can do is receive it as it is. Hold it, guard it, cherish it, keep it, but all of those things being one more form of receiving it as it is. So what the article does is it calls out this idea sweeping through American Christianity, but also just leveling, absolutely leveling uh, massive areas of the Missouri Synod. The article points out that these are largely the city areas that very intentionally successful churches were given men who believed these ideologies so that they could say, look, it's working, which is, oh, well, you know, that's what the article claims. Anecdotally, I'd say it sure looks like it's what happened, but I, I don't know. I don't have the actual numbers. I'm not the scientist on that one. But the claim was made, the claim is made, that if we don't do these things, if we don't actually manipulate the situation to better grow and, and orient the church toward a seeker-friendly, you know, what have you, that as a result, then, the churches would, would fail. They, they'd fade and they'd perish and they, they wouldn't grow at all. That you, you can't, and this is part of the problem. It's not that, that, it's not that you just want to say, hey, it's okay for us to sing our little Kumbaya song up front. It's that you want to say, the Kumbaya song is, in fact, what God needs us to do because of the type of people that are out there today, and that the liturgical song, which for you perhaps means organ, right? But for me means ancient words about the Trinity or about grace alone. Well, that that's in the way because of the organ, because of the tune, that, 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 that God's word can't work through bad music. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I'm, I'm not, not a fan of the bad music, mind you. I want it sung well too. Yeah. But, but the claim, the claim, right? That it can't be done. So, and this is where the anecdotal evidence certainly seems seems real. You can't in a, in a big city church these days, big big city area these days. You can't go to very many LCMS churches where they have a predominant and high regard for liturgy. They're few and far between. Why is that? Is it because they had to change for it to work, or is it because that's just kind of where the guys who thought that way got pushed and got put and are, so they changed it. I mean, I've, I've heard a number of stories as well of churches that were doing quite well, quite strong. And the, actually, the article is going to point this out too. There was one church that was doing very well by means of word and sacrament alone. But see, this didn't jive with the agenda, with the ideal. Remember, idealism, ideology is, is a social disease. You know, it's a political movement. It can't, when a thing becomes an ideology, it cannot stand things which question it. The worst political movements in the world have always been ideologies. So what when this the church in the article was doing very well on its own with just liturgy and pastoral care, yeah, this this was a challenge to the uh, the the dreams, the the story, the narrative that was being told about how we had to make all these changes so that we could grow these churches. And you can go find the article, Google it, you'll be able to find it without too much trouble. But the long and short of it is that the the surrounding political area went and put another church right next door, more or less, trying to show how well it'll really grow. And that one didn't work. <laughs> that one failed. And then the people from it, well, they came to the other one and they joined it. And then they pushed those agendas there in that one. And then it, it too began to fade, right? or at least ceased to be the thriving place it was. Now, all of this, again, is anecdotal. Yeah. All of it is a story. All of it is somebody's opinion and, and the past. But I think it's I think it's fascinating what, what it points out, though. And, I, and it's about time we call this what tiger, this elephant, what it is. It points out that since the church growth movement began in the United States, the church has done anything but grow. And the more that we have changed, the more that we have accommodated, the more that we have said we need to be like the culture so we can reach the culture, the less we have reached the culture. We've been able to grab the disen disenchanted Christians from a, a variety of small congregations and pull them into a nice big country club congregation somewhere, but there's less of us than there were in the beginning. 
and you throw the whole <laughs> failure to procreate and demographic bomb that's fallen on us as well, and now we're really in a, in a stew, aren't we? The article points out, and this is numbers you can't really argue with, that since 2000, that's in 18 years, right? It's 2018. Since 2000, the LCMS has lost 20% of its membership. Now, granted, a lot of that is the elderly passing away and the young we haven't had to replace them, but 20%, dear heavens, <laughs> that's a lot. That's a lot. Are you sure it's all those passing away? Uh, it, and it tends not to be, you know, those small churches that are losing vast droves of people. When you're 40 people big in the first place, you don't lose a lot of people at once. It just can't happen. They aren't there to lose. So where's the revolving door? Which reminds me of a study that was done, the Reveal Now study by Bill Hybels Church in uh, Willow Creek near Chicago, where I'm at now. Uh, a couple years back, Roseboro on Pirate Christian Radio covered this quite a bit at the time. It is big study, big internal study of how well we're doing, how well we're doing, and, and what they found, and this, this is like the dominant, him and Rick Warren, the, the dominant church growth churches of the last 30 years who everyone's trying to be like, and what they found was they had about a 20% core of the congregation that was actually their congregation that had been there for like 15, 18 years. Again, I'm pulling the numbers out of my, my backside here, but, but generally that's kind of the idea. They'd been there for a while, and the other 80% was literally a revolving door. And they were staying less than a couple of years. And just more were coming in, and then more were leaving. And, and back and forth, back and forth. And the thing is, okay, well, what are you saying? What are you, where are they going, right? Are they all going to these small mom and pop churches? No, they're not, because they're not growing. Are they going to another church down the road that's bigger and better? There isn't one. So where are they going, right? They're done. They're done. And so you have this bigger picture, right, where this movement in one sense by very clever marketing and catering to the fleshly desires of dis, dis, uh, disengaged or disenchanted people has emptied the pews of small churches, drawn them into big country club churches, which don't actually keep them, but over time just kind of release them back into the wild as what? Well, not as Christians, right? At least not as practicing Christians. I don't know. Maybe this is something we should talk about. What is a Christian? What is a Christian? So if you have a faith that feels good, you feel close to God, but you don't go to church, are you a Christian? And, well, maybe the better question is, for how long? And, well, how would you know when you stopped? I mean, it, it, it would it be when you stopped feeling like you had faith? Or, or would it be when, what? Would it be when your pastor told you, where are you? You should be in church? My guess is you wouldn't like that, right? Isn't that interesting? So who are these people being released back into the wilds of the American pagan consumer context, having been told that Christianity is about what? Relationship, uh, feeling strong, having good financial practices, and having Sunday morning to do what I want, I guess, so I'm going to go do it. What? Where are they now? And has this grown... Well, is this church growth? Or is this you know, church culling? Are we depopulating ourselves without even realizing it? So, so anyway, I, I'm saying more than I actually intended to say on this matter. But what struck me again about this article was the courage of the individual. Now, I'm kind of picking up on it, I guess, a little bit, and I'm going <laughs> to put my own foot in it. The courage of this individual to say these things, to say, look, 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 if we just assess the numbers of your argument, I think your argument's hogwash to begin with, but if we actually assess the pragmatics of your argument, your argument is backwards. You've said that you need contemporary music in order to grow the church, and without it, the church will die. And look, it's your churches that are dying. Are there churches with liturgy that are dying too? Yes. Those that have not had children and those whose people have uh, have left for churches hungering for contemporary music who were not prepared, right? Who were not forewarned. So it's not as if the church is not struggling mightily in this place anyway, but it's time to get past this argument that somehow your liturgical innovations are going to fix it like that, or, or that you need them in order to fix it. You want to have unity in the Missouri Synod? We got to get past that argument. We don't need your band, and I don't. You don't need my organ. We get, we got to get past that. It's not real. It's it's a it's a smokescreen that Satan has thrown up in the air, in order to deceive us while we drown. 
Now, what is real and what the majority of the guys over here with me that I think want the organ, or at least sound like they want the organ, is not so much that they want the organ, but they want a certain pattern of sound words to remain. They want a history of preaching Jesus from texts of Scripture to remain. They want to not think that our hope lies in how good we get at marketing. And this, of course, brings us back to uh, the courage to be Protestant, right? This book that I've been riffing on here and there, where David Wells points out that what we're really dealing with, what's really going on, what's really sweeping American Christianity as a heresy is the heresy of marketing. That for the last 40, 50, 60 years, it is the business movement of America, not Christians with business degrees, but the actual business movement of America bleeding into our theology and teaching us how to think, giving us the worldview, giving us the first principles by which we decide what is true and what is false. It is marketing questions that we ask, not truth questions that we ask. And I would contend, above all of what I've said before, that maybe that's why the pews are empty. Because you can get really good at marketing for an event. Like you can, it's easy, you lie. You tell people that you're going to give them lots of money for free and they'll show up at one event. What they won't do is keep coming back. They only do that for value. And so if you really want to have gatherings around Jesus' words, then you have to have the actual value of his words. Yeah? And I'm sure the majority of LCMS pastors would agree with me on that that statement, but I'm not sure we actually do when it gets on the ground. What are Jesus' words? What are we to say about these words? Oh, no, I, I thought about this earlier, and I wasn't sure I was going to go on to this today, but I will go on to this today. Because there's another infection, in my mind at least, in the Missouri Synod that has a lot to do with how much we, we want to say we're preaching the word, but we're not. What we're doing is we're taking a Bible text and we're, we're studying it, and then we're talking about ideas we have from it that we think are important. And we take those ideas and we put them very much in our own words And then, because of, uh, this is what we've been taught for decades now, decades and decades of homiletics teaching, we have to, we have to trick you, listener, into listening to these words. We have to come up with some way of, of making it entertaining for you. You're too much of an adult to just really have us talk to you about what the Bible says. So we've got to kind of majestically and rhetorically, dramatically put it into a little bit of a, a mono, what is it, a monologue delivery. And since that's very difficult to do well, well, now we've been taught to write it out, write a script for monologue delivery. And tell me if I'm wrong, guys, right? At seminary, and then they say, and memorize it. But nobody does, because nobody's got time for that. <laughs> and so what do we do instead? Yeah, you know, listener, right? We read it. So now we've got an attempt to dramatically and majestically sell you a, a, a presentation about the Word of God, which we're going to read to you as best we can and with, you know, loud gesticulations. Yeah. I think personally, that's hard to listen to. Like I, I, I've been in a lot of churches in the last two years now without being the preacher. And, and I tell you, and this is just like my flesh talking here, but it's, it's not just my flesh, it's just my human nature. It's harder to listen to somebody who's reading off of a script. Even if they're like looking up and doing a pretty good job of it, it's harder to stay focused on them than it is to listen to someone who is simply what I would call preaching, yeah. J- jiving, riffing, talking. Going from the Bible. I remember, I won't call this guy out, but there was somebody who guest preached here in Rockford a while back, and I just absolutely adored what he did. And I don't know how much time he put into this sermon. I mean, for all I know, he looked at the text three minutes before he walked into the pulpit. He opened up his Bible, and he went through the text, and man, was it a humdinger. Oh, it was good. Why? Because it was the text, and the text is good. And so somehow, this is my, my point, this is my jibe at our preaching scenario, our preaching state. 
somehow we've managed to put ourselves between the text and the hearer. And this, oh, this is stolen from us. It's stolen from us, the actual word. So I'll talk about preaching the word of God. What I'm doing is I'm, I'm giving you my words, right? And I think this is a grand, grand danger that with the marketing reality has served to, oh, man, ignorize us, if that makes sense, to make us an ignorant people, a people who neither know what we believe or why we believe it, because it, you can't really learn, not, not really from these mm, homiletic deliverances. It's very difficult to do. You can take notes. If you take notes, you can learn. But who's doing that, really? Who's doing that? Nobody. Oh, you're confirmants because you make them. Okay. So no one's doing that. So, so what we're doing is we're not learning. We're kind of being entertained badly, right? But we'll put up with it because it's church and God says so. So we have to do it, right? And, and that's happening. And then some are realizing that, oh, that's not very appealing. Let's find a way to, to market a better story. And then the marketing begins to pick at something which everyone else is like missing. Oh, yeah. Wow. God, because it's been really painful before, you know, as good as it was, Pastor, I really love that sermon. It was very deep. It was, you should teach at the seminary because you're really smart. Yeah. (laughs) That's not a good thing to hear. (laughs) Um, uh, As much as they would say that, right, when they get the glimmer of something that will entertain them for that hour, well, that's what they've been trained to be. It's what you've been trained to be by the American condition a consumer. And what do you consume more than anything else? I mean, you got food and water, and then you consume experiences, you consume entertainment. And so, of course, of course, when that marketing, business, entertainment-driven thinking begins to influence the way that pastors ask, how can I keep my people engaged? What do they come up with? It's not going to be more Word of God. And it's not going to be tradition, history, legacy, right? It's going to be something else entirely. So, uh, David Wells talks about a church service in 2006. And, you know, you would think, I think this is supposed to be, in the chapter, it's supposed to be um, (laughs) uh, kind of showing how far things have gone. And it's it's really quite tame in in my mind. But in 2006, there was a Easter uh, sermon, Easter event, where the senior pastor came out and he was dressed like Superman. And in my mind, that that it, I was just talking a moment ago about preaching in the Missouri Synod. But I tell you, this this event here, this little trick this guy's pulling, it's exactly my issue with preaching in the Missouri Synod. Like we really literally believe that you people in the pew are too stupid to hear me talk about the Bible for any length of time without me giving you something to stare at like a Superman costume. That's how dumb you are. And, well, don't worry, we're here to help, right? That's the idea. And and Wells is complaining about the same idea. And, and Wells is not a Missouri Synod guy. I mean, this is outside of our circles. He's, he's a Calvinist, and he's a, a decent thinker, and he's a Western thinker. But he says that our minds are so inert in our own thinking, so lifeless, that until we're prodded to action by eye-popping things, uh, there's no hope. There's no hope for us. And he then later in the chapter, he likens this to something else, which I've, if you've been listening to any of the stuff I'm doing regularly recently, you, you probably have come across my work with issues, etc. on parenting. We've done a series on parenting that's lasted, oh, I don't even know now, 15, 16, 18 episodes, and we just finished it up. And it, it is near and dear to my heart. I am a parent. I don't know how good a one I am. I know I have thoughts about it, and we've tried, and that my kids at the moment seem to be, <laughs> they still love me, uh, even my 13-year-old, maybe especially my 13-year-old, and, uh, and they seem to be growing in the faith. In fact, I have plans to, to do a little episode on that here uh, at some time in the next couple of weeks. But but Wells brings up parenting and, and it, as an example or a picture of what happens to churches once we give into the marketing drive. And it really doesn't matter whether whether you're talking about playing with guitars and bands or organ I don't care, right? If you think that's what I'm still talking about, then then you're part of the you are the problem because you think that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about marketing. Period. Whatever you think needs to be marketed, the point is if we think we have to market the church, we're Pelagians. Now, am I saying don't have a website? No, of course not. 
But I am saying that we'd be fine without a website. We would. We'd be fine without the yellow pages. We'd be fine without a pretty building. All we need is the words of Jesus. And then he says you need water, bread, and wine. So we need that too. That's all we need. And if we can't say that honestly and start at that foundation, then there is no hope for unity in the church. There isn't. Because we're going to have our opinions be more important than the word of God when we get to the table to talk. And we got to get rid of that. We have to let our opinions be willing to die. So, so this idea that marketing and what marketing does to our mindset, the moment you have somebody in the, in the church that comes up to you and says, I don't like this. And they assume then, because this is the way cons- uh, customers work, the customer is always right, that you as the manager of the shop need to do something to please them, right? That, that's how it works. And every pastor knows that it's kind of a jeopardy moment. When somebody comes up and says, Pastor, I don't like this, because it's like, well, do I give in or do I not? How do I how do I make them happy still without what? Without abandoning something. Yeah. Without abandoning something valuable. God willing, you pray as they be Pastor, I need to talk to you. Okay. Hopefully it's something that doesn't get in the way of the Bible. Okay. Yeah. And, well, Pastor, I need this, I need that. Okay, I think we can do that. But the the what the point that Bells is gonna make here with this little story which I'm going to read and then riff on, is that that moment, that giving in, once it starts and once it does encroach on anything real, there's no end to it. It never stops until everything is gone entirely. Well, says the evangelical church, or at least a good slice of it, and with that, he's throwing Missouri Synod in there, whether he knows it or not, is nervous, twitchy, and touchy about consumer desire, ready to change in a nanosecond at the slightest hint that tastes and interests have changed. Those who attend churches are now like any other customer that you might meet in the mall. Displease them in any way, and they will take their business elsewhere. That is the fear that lurks in many a church leader's soul, because they know that it is how the marketplace works. Now, say what you will. No, the church is not a market. It's not to be sold. Okay, you say that if you want. We're in a marketplace now. And I know it. I know it every Sunday. I know how the marketplace works. And I'm always, uh, it, the, the fear lurks in my heart. I am nervous that because I hold the truth line on this, that, or the other thing, that Grandma Jean's going to walk away. Or Cousin Bob, he's going to be angry, and then you got the whole clan is pissed off. And now, they, now half of them won't come, and yada, yada. All because of what? Color of the carpet air conditioning, something like that, right? The bulletin has a, this the pastor has the, too many typos. That comma right there, it's been there too many times. I'm done, right? And while that sounds uh, hysterical, pastors will tell, ask your pastor. It's crazy. It's crazy what people get mad about. Yeah, and what they're willing to perhaps even take their business elsewhere over. But here, here's the thing. It brings to mind, he says, the haplessness of parents in a home where the children, amidst sullen moods and a creeping sense of injustice inflicted on them, decide that they will take it no longer. It begins with thoughts, the rebellious mists that shroud the mind and hold off the sun's light and warmth, but soon that becomes seeds, and the seeds find fertile soil in the internal wounds suffered during the journey to adulthood. The parents, sensing something is amiss, scour their minds to think of what it could have what could have gone wrong and understanding little of the labyrinthine coils of the adolescent psyche decide to back off and take the path that inflicts the least pain the poor things now I, he's using some pretty language there it's nice and prosaic <laughs> yeah uh, what he's getting at here is so your kid gets to be what seven eight nine twelve thirteen and they get a little emotional and morbid and and twisty and turny and the initial thought is, well, I should have less discipline in their life. I should back off on them. I shouldn't make, when, they, when, I, when I say these things to this child, that child gets angry. So I shouldn't say these things to this child. And what he's saying is, oh, you poor thing. That's your tactic? Your tactic is to have less boundaries? Ooh, that's not going to go very well at all. Now, the parents, they're only trying to do the best they can. But unfortunately, they do not quite understand that they are staring down the gun of a barrel of a stick-up artist. They are about to be robbed. Out of their good intentions, space is enlarged around the child. Latitude is allowed. Rules are rescinded. Rebukes are stifled, except in rare cases, and expectations are lifted. However, parents being parents, they are never entirely out of the woods with these children, because try as they might, they are never fully successful in setting their children free. But what is interesting 
about this painful tango of parent and child is that the more the demands and expectations of the parent are moderated, the more onerous and intolerable to the children do the children find that those which remain are. Parental moderation only excites fresh cries of outrage and pain. All right, so where I've seen this most in our present day is in the, uh, the public tantrum thrown by many a child, the one, the two, the three-year-old. And there's a, there's a theory, I don't, I don't know if it's a theory or, or an ideal or what, that somehow ignoring the child in public is going to be the right way to parent the child. And every time you do this, the child just gets worse. He just gets louder. You know why? Because he doesn't want to be ignored. (laughs) You know, because he really wants your attention. Uh, uh, And and the thing is, though, what are you going to do? You you can't turn and give him what he's crying for. I've seen that too, though. You know what that does? Oh, stop, stop. I'll, I'll give you this. You just stop crying. You know what that does? That means that his crying works. You've just done the Pavlovian thing with your your little child, and now the child knows cause and effect. And soon enough, to get anything they want, they they cry and moan and throw the fit. But you know what really needs to be done for that poor child is they need a boundary. They need a box. They need to know where the edge is. They need to know what civilization is. Yeah? So what they need is for you to turn to them as a civil adult, adult and talk to them about what right behavior is. We don't cry like this. This is not what we do. And you need to do that pretty early on and pretty constantly. And eventually you need to get a little angry. This is not what we do. No, you are wrong, right? Because you know what? That's what other people are going to do to them in real life when they grow up and act that way. If they grow up without any boundary with regard to how they treat others, others are going to come back with rage. (laughs) Yeah. So if you actually want your kid to know what life is like, if the kid does something to make you angry, it's not so bad for you to let them know that you're angry. Now, does that mean you should fly into a rage and smack them around? No, of course not. Of course not. You want to be civil. Yeah. But there's a way to be civil and angry at the same time. The point here is that the boundary, the boundary is actually really good for the child. And this works with your 13, your 14, your 15 year old as well. They hate it. They rage against the boundary. But you know why? It's not necessarily that they want the boundary to be gone. If you move the boundary, they're going to rage against the next boundary you set up. Oh, your curfew was eight. Now it's 10. We'll let it be 10. Well, why why, why 10, right? That that lasts for a week and then they want it later again. You know why? They really want to find the boundary that doesn't move. That's why. They want to find comfort. They want to find security. And the only way that happens is if they find a foundation that can't budge which is why when the parent says to the child, this is not how we behave and takes them aside, even takes them out of the room and has a little conversation with them about, look, this is not cool. This is reality here. You're going to come back. You're going to act like this. That's, that's a foundation for security for the child's mind and conscience. And the same is true with the, the teenager who wants to know, do you love me enough to tell me no? And it's not an intellectual thing. They're not in their heads saying, I hope he'll say no so that it's I will know that he... And this is a psyche thing. It's, it's way down in the, in the subconscious, way in the, the primordial cortex of the mind. They need to know that you're still their parent. And they're asking you to demonstrate it in some solid and foundational way. And if you remove that, if you remove that from them, well, then they have to look for it still. And so they go further and further. They rebel more and more. They throw themselves further and further afield, trying to find out where is the place, where is the line that's not allowed to be crossed. But the parents, baffled at this unreasonable behavior, retreat even more, says Wells. Yet the further they retreat, the more intense the resentment becomes. Nothing less than their total abject surrender is acceptable. And when they do yield and hold aloft their white flag of surrender, they are despised even more deeply. Just so, the consuming impulse, once it enters a church, makes individual preferences the deciding and driving factor. These preferences become the standard by which the church is thereafter measured. So, when you as a congregation, when you as a pastor, when you as a district president or church leader, began saying, well, yeah, we can move that, we can change that. No, no problem, that's not a big deal. It's, it's the beginning of a slippery slope. It's, and, <laughs> and I'm not against change, mind you. In fact, I, you ask anybody who's been under me or around me in pastoral, pastoral situations as a leader in the church, you know 
Uh, you, you would hear from them, I probably want too much change. I push it too hard. But I'm not talking about fixing the plumbing, right? I'm talking about being church. I don't want to change anything about actually being church. I don't want to move, I don't want, I don't want, to, want to move a single guiding post from the absolute reality of our biblical heritage, our, our, the divine service that we receive, and the, the words which have been drawn from the scriptures to remind us of this, while I would be open to a conversation about adding to those words, pruning those words, expanding those words, there's plenty of space for that in the seasons of the church year and a new hymnody and uh, things like that, right? But man, we, what we could really use right now is the Psalms set to song in a way that's really easy and singable. I'd love that. I don't, I don't mind chanting. I love chanting. It's hard to teach. I love it. Uh, but, but you know what I love even more? The very few times when you get an actual psalm just flowing as a song. Oh, it's so great. The words are so good. Let's put our energy into that, you know. Uh, I don't want to move anything that really is the substance of who we are. Now, the debate, of course, is others are saying, well, we're not moving those things. Okay, so so here, how's this on for size? What do you do in a situation where you have two individuals that are fighting? They're, they're in a fist fight, right? And it's obvious to everybody that there's they, they both got blood on their face. And you go up and you go, what's going on? And the one guy's, guy goes, we're fighting. And the other guy goes, no, we're not. And you're like, well, but you're fighting. And, and the one guy's like, yeah, we're fighting. And the other guy goes, no, we're not. What do you do with that, right? Because that's the situation we find ourselves in <laughs> as, as Missouri Center right now where you have this this fight over the liturgy. And it's in my experience. And guys out there, if you're listening and you want to get mad at me, go ahead. But like you guys who are really pushing your band because you think you got to do it, like you keep saying you're, that we're, we're not really fighting, that we're not that different, that there's no big deal. And it's like... <laughs> Well, how are we ever going to reconcile then <laughs> if you can't admit that there's a problem? Yeah, you can't admit we disagree. Now, what is the disagreement? And I think this is what's scary. Yeah, the disagreement is over what the word of God actually is because the guys on the liturgy side of things are saying, you guys are abandoning the word of God with your church growth movement paradigm. And you're saying, no, we're not. We still have the word of God. Okay, well then what do we have a disagreement over? It's actually over the word of God. <laughs> Yeah, and what the Word of God is. And it's not going to be say, solved by jargon. It's not going to be solved by saying, well, I like Word and Sacrament, or I like Law and Gospel. No, that's not going to do it either. Because there's something keeping you from promoting a liturgical option, a, a strong, high liturgical option in your own life and midst. Yeah, And there's something keeping me from promoting any type of revivalist, uh, consumerist option, <laughs> a contemporary option. In my own midst, what is that thing? What is that distinction? For me, it's actually, I, I, in my own mind, it's law and gospel. It's the fact that when I walk into the revivalist's contemporary world, all I get is a mishmash of do-goodism and very little blood of Jesus, grace alone. And I don't want any more of that ever again. And so I'm out. You, you, can, you can take those songs and keep them. Yeah? And I'll be happy to sing really boring, really badly sung songs so long as they're about Jesus. Well, I'm going to try my best to make them not boring and not badly sung. So what is it on your side? What is it that the liturgy is, is doing that's so in the way? Or that your people are so too stupid, too bored, to what? To learn about. I remember another friend of mine uh, who, we, we're, we're d- d- debaters in this debate itself, but we, we're, we're old buddies and we ran into each other and he was given a paper and I'm not going to, I'm not going to go into any details about it, but he was given a paper about an old theologian, uh, someone who we both respected very much, somebody who's long deceased and uh, well enough known. And he is kind of something he'd spent a lot of time researching and cared a great deal about. And I was like, oh, that's great. You know, that's so cool that you're still into that kind of stuff right now. I didn't know you were into that anymore. So are you teaching this at your parish? And he just went, oh, no, oh, no, my people couldn't take this. And I'm, I'm like, what? Then, then what, are you, what, what are you teaching then? And I didn't ask that. I probably should have, you know. But if, if, if your people can't take it, then what can they take? What, what are you training them for? Discipling. What is the discipleship unto? 
Does it have an end or is it just keeping them in the room? Because if it's just keeping them in the room, look, we're back at marketing again, aren't we? It's just about trying to cajole by tickling the flesh. And indeed, indeed, I will maintain that is the thing, killing churches. Tickling the flesh has what has led us to our demographic problem. Tickling the flesh is what has led us to the migration of people out of congregations that are too small for them and their mind and what they expect from their country club to big ones and then out of those big ones to a life they'd rather live. Marketing is indeed, and Wells is quite right to point it out, marketing is indeed the problem. Another story for you. I was a pastor for a while in Springfield, Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia. It was not the happiest days of my life. A small parish, we struggled. Good people, we never quite saw eye to eye. Um, I know they're, they're still there, and I still see some of them on Facebook sometimes, and they got a good pastor taking care of them. The, you know, and, and so, no bones about them, right? But I remember always kind of wanting to find a way to take us from that 55 attendance to, oh, I don't know, 120. Yeah. Because then you know, we'd be able to solve a couple of the financial difficulties that were there. There was always a, an end date kind of hanging over my head. I had to do work with another organization to make the ends meet and all this kind of stuff. And so I kind of like hoped for that. So what do, you, what do you hope for then as a pastor in that moment? You know, of course, you're going to spend time out trying to find contact points. And, and I did that. World VR Lasting also got started during that time period. But you're also going to really be excited when a Missouri Synod couple moves to the area, right? Especially if they got three kids. Great. Young family, Missouri Synod. I'm the only church for 25 minutes in any direction. Only one. Only Missouri Synod church. And you know what? Every other one in any direction looks just like me. <laughs> You're not going to get anything more. There's no more youth group, right? It's, it's just a small group of people. There's no more exciting band. No, we're all just doing all that we can. You got some really bad band over there. I mean, it's really bad band, that one. But, you know, it's <laughs> they're doing what they can too, right? So, like, we really are the only game in town. And I, I they, they smiled and they shook my hand. They're from, I don't know, Indiana somewhere. They smiled and they shook my hand. And, oh, we're Missouri Synod. That's great. Give me your information. Let's see. You know, I'd love to see you guys again. Oh, yeah, maybe we'll be back. Okay. And, and you know, three weeks later, I I, uh, <laughs> I sent an email. Hey, you know, it was, it was great to have you here. We, it'd be really awesome to see you again. It's, uh, we're, we love Word and Sacrament. You know, we love Jesus here, and we'd love to feed you with that. So, I don't know what the email said, but uh, my, at least she wrote back to me. You know, God bless her for that. But she said, you know, yeah, we visited a couple other churches in the area, and there really wasn't anything here for us. So we're joining, and I don't even know what the name of it was, you know, Holy Roller Big Baptist Church or whatever. Uh, we're, we're choosing, we're choosing uh, Calvary up here, uh, whatever it is, Calvary Chapel, uh, because, well, they got, the, they got the youth group we're looking for, and they got a little more of the worship style we're looking for. And so, well, thank you. We really, nothing against your preaching. Your preaching was great. It was really, really good, but, but we're, we're going to go where the music and the youth group is. So again, you know, what what are you what are you teaching your people toward? What are you training them for? Is it that that they could leave behind the body and blood of Jesus Christ and their baptism into him for the sake of the music that you've said is necessary for them to be Christians? Because that's what they did. And I'm not going to say they're going to go to hell. I don't know. But dear heavens, dear heavens, it means that they never knew, right? So if they're not going to hell, it's because they never actually knew about the body and blood of Jesus and they never actually knew that their baptism into him was a real thing because they just joined a place where they're going to be told that they're not real things and they're fine with that. So if they knew, if they knew, if you did a good enough job teaching them and they knew that, they are going to hell because they're abandoning it. And I'm, I'm going to say, no, they're ignorant. Right? We've, I said this earlier. We've ignorized our people. They're ignorant. Felicitous inconsistency. Thanks be to God. Is that really what you want? Do you want to create situations in which we have to say, well, hopefully it's a felicitous inconsistency? Or do you want something more? I got an email up here in Rockford a couple weeks ago, two months ago. Somebody said, we're moving from yada yada place to that area. And we're trying to reach out to churches to find out what they got available. 
And I'm like, I'm like reading this, and you know that that story I just told was like going through the back of my head. It's like, okay, what's this guy looking for? And by the end of the, <laughs> by the end of the uh, the thing, he says, so can you please tell me about music opportunities in the church, and your youth group, your youth program? And it's like, oh man, it's great. So you, see, so you don't really don't care what I think about Jesus, you know. Of course, I'm Missouri Synod, so it's all fine. We're all Missouri Synod here. So no one, there's no difference in our preaching whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Sure, yeah, okay. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and all you really care about is my youth program. So I sent back, you know, I said, well, uh, we believe very strongly in youth catechesis here. We're, we're, I'm new here. We're trying to reinvigorate the entire program for lifelong learning. We want high school kids and adult Bible study, but we're big into higher things events as well because they teach the liturgy there and Nothing wrong with kids loving to sing the hymnody. And we got lots of music opportunities. We've got a pretty decent choir. We got a bell choir for the kids and all sorts of cool stuff. Da, 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 da. And I, I heard back, and I you know I don't know. I don't know. Maybe he's still gonna show up some Sunday. But I heard back, yeah, well, we're in town. When, when we finally get in town, we might drop by and give you a look. No. We're gonna, thank you. Thank you for your information. I don't know. And it, he he may not be take two of the scenario. So I don't want to put that on him, you know. Not at all. But I'm going to put it on you, listener. Why is the youth group so important? Because it's not. The church did just great without youth group for a long time. And ever since we started youth group, you know what we've done? Not great. Now, I'm not going to blame youth group, but I'm not going to say we need youth group because it obviously has not done much for us. And music, well, music is a great gift it's a great first article gift, and it's very useful for lifting up the words of God. But for that very same reason, it's a great idol and can easily become the thing which steals from you the words of God because you're going to love the music so much, so deeply and so truly, that it doesn't matter what the words say, you're going to sing it anyway. There was a guy named Arius long ago who taught a heresy that was that Jesus is not truly God. He was more a god of sorts, or a son of God. And now this is ancient church history here, and the lines are a little blurry, but the tradition holds. Do you know how he got popular? Do you know how he really made his mark? The guy was good at writing jingles. He could, he could write a tune. So he wrote some songs. And those songs, man, they carried that heresy all the way through the church, and Arianism nearly destroyed us. Now, the Word of God stood its own at the Council of Nicaea, Hat tip to, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, what should I call him, uh, uh, Deep Papa Nicholas with his one-two combo, left hook. Uh, <laughs> inside joke, you can uh, you can Google it if you want. You can try St. Nicholas at the council. Um, but, uh, well, the Word of God stood, its, stood the test at the council, but man, it was close. And much, much of the Christian world had been swayed to Arianism by the well, by the power of the music, I think. Just like today. Is, is it really just a tune? Is it really just a song? What does it say? I've been going to a doctor recently for some um, acupuncture, actually, uh, on a little bit of a series. Going to see if it can fix my cholesterol levels. We'll see. I'll, I'll keep you posted. So I have to lie there with needles in me for 20 minutes a couple times a week and Three times a week at first, since we're going slower from there on out. But initially, quite a bit. Lying there in the dark with needles sticking in my forehead and my ears and my hands and my, my feet. And it's it's interesting. You know, took away my wife's headaches really fast, to tell you that. They got some music playing. And the music that they're playing is uh, it's Pandora. You know how Pandora, like the songs get repeated too often? You know, <laughs> the, only, the playlist only gets so long. So it's like this, it's not cheesy, I'd rather it were, were some cheesy um, uh, kind of uh, spa music, but it's just like light piano. But the lady who no longer works there, but used to work the front desk and sort of like was the one clicking like all the time initially, uh, she's an old rocker. You know, she liked herself some some Metallica and some Nirvana and some of those other things. And so it, it kind of got into this uh, piano versions of their songs. Uh, sweet, sweet child of mine, you know, uh, on piano, just piano only. And it, it is interesting how a song I really love as rock and roll, I I cannot stand as piano. Uh, the Nirvana one was the worst. It just it's just so pedantic. It's like the same note over and over again. But anyway, so so this music's always kind of going there, and you know I've heard uh, nothing else matters so many times via piano, and I love that song, but it's terrible piano. And then. 
just the other day, first time I heard this one, I heard this one and it came on and went, da 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 And I like, it almost caught my breath. It's been a long time since I heard that tune. I don't know, you know that tune? Yeah. It still, it still stirs me. And that's what scares me. It's, it's a song called Open the Eyes of My Heart. And I learned it from a band called Sonic Flood, who had taken some praise songs and made them rock, honestly. Finally. You know, because most praise songs don't rock you. 60s hippies, they're, you're kind of like elevator music. Sonic Flood made it rock, at least 80s, 90s style. And, uh, man, I, I used to blast that thing. Blast that album. Everywhere I'd go, I'd play that thing over and over and over again. Loved it. The song's terrible, though. It, it, it doesn't really teach anything. In fact, if anything, it teaches the wrong thing. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. I don't even know what that means, honestly. The closest thing to a biblical reality of that is Moses being a doofus and being told, no, (laughs) you can't or I kill you, right? See you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Okay, so now you want to be Isaiah in the room where he's saying, woe is me, man of unclean lips among a people of unclean lips. Is, Is that, is that, is that what? Those texts are there. The holy, holy, holy. I, I do want to sing holy, holy, holy. Where do we sing holy, holy, holy? Now, at the supper, do you even know that we do that? With the cherubim, the archangels, all the company of heaven. That song, what, what struck me in that moment, the reason I'm telling the story, is that the music, the music was why I listened to that song. It was never about the words. And, and when it played the other day and it struck deep inside me and I wanted I wanted the music back that scared me that shows you how strong it is how powerful it is that the music matters more than the words and that's indeed I think uh, the heart of the debate that we're in now is this market driven American Christian church experience has attached itself to the jingle for the sake of growth and as the growth hasn't happened, and we find ourselves staring down the, the abyss of a pretty dark time, but now entirely divided from ourselves over the jingles, well, what kind of idolatry are we indeed in then? No? That this is what's keeping us from the real mission of the church? But then again, see, that's just it. We, we don't agree. What is the real mission of the church. I mean, can the church die? Will it die if we get rid of all the music so we can be unified? If we took away the music, if we took away the organ and we took away the band, all of us, as Missouri Synod, on one Sunday at once so we could be unified, how many would leave our churches? Have we not become ignorant after all? Was that worth a dollar? What about five? If so, Pastor Fisk and his family would love to have it, in part to pay for technology and paperwork to keep Rev Fisk Raw going, and in part to just enjoy a night out together. Pledging $1.25 on Patreon, only $5 a month, lets the worker know his labor is appreciated. And if you're a true fan, you can give even more. You can find the link to Patreon in the show notes and check out the other giving levels there, including advertising your product, your family, or your congregation on Rev Fisk Raw. Lock and load, then rock on.